can I say to you, Charles, thank you so much for coming on Cinema, Life and Everything. How are you doing today? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, actually. It's been a little while since I've done one of these, but it's it's nice to be back in the zone again. So um, you've picked, and I'm very excited about this one as well, because as soon as you told me your three film picks, I'm yeah. like, yes, yes, yes. One that I've not watched in a while, but I had a great pleasure in watching again and can't wait to discuss with you. But we go, before we go any further, could you uh, just tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit more about yourself, please? Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm a director or aspiring director. Uh, I directed a short film called Bird Lime, uh, where you were one of the characters. Mm -hmm. And I uh, also work as an art director in advertising, where I direct commercials, so a bit different. But I guess an overall creative and a, a big movie enthusiast. Sure, sure. Um, it's, it's, it's a great place to be. I find that as well, like with acting, sometimes you're given uh, film roles, uh, television roles, theatre roles. But at the same time, you are pulled in towards commercials as well. And I do think yeah. there's that interesting mix of art and commerce where you can still have something valid to say, but it has to have the auspices of selling a product at the same time can you yeah. can you can you still find the art in that sense of commerce at all or is it something that you have trouble balancing no definitely definitely there's a lot of creativity in like commercial like obviously our job is to make it exciting to kind of like you know find new trends find new ways to kind of like you know re pretty much like craft something yeah. doesn't matter what you sell but the hardest part is obviously getting that creativity across to the clients. You always do with like different type of people. Some people are very kind of like creative friendly and excited to try new things and not afraid to kind of like go into like unknown territory. Some people are just not into creativity and that the hardest one you have to work with when you have to sell their ideas is like, I don't get it. And <laughs> Being in that place where they kind of like strip back the creativity and the commercial just becomes, you know, like the rubbish one you see on TV. Sometimes it happens, you know. Yeah, you have yeah. To and I think that's what obviously me and Lewis and Simeon, that's kind of like we used to work together for the same agency. And I think that's what kind of like gave us the motivation to kind of like write our own short film. Because as an art director, I had the skill to direct. Lewis was a motion designer, so he had the skills to be a DOP and kind mm. of like handle cameras and everything. And Simeon, as a copywriter, had the skills to write a script. And we just wanted to do something where it was just for us, where there was no feedback from clients. We didn't have to please anyone but ourselves. And then to just craft a film that we would love to watch in the cinema. That's such a way I could way of putting it. And also sort of almost finding that balance there, not only within what you're doing, if you're maybe making a commercial or making a film, but within yourself as well to feed the commercial animal, understanding that we all need a yeah. certain amount of money to survive, but also yeah. fulfilling your creative self as well. So you still feel like what you do is valid and worthwhile and nourishes your own yeah. spirit. Yeah, it's a fine, it's a fine line because you can get lost in like trying to please other people when you kind of like craft a commercial, but you have to remember like you you're still the creative. You have to make sure like you're proud of the work. And yes. essentially when I have a commercial or like, any type of camp campaign for advertising. I always make sure, like, would that go into my portfolio? That's kind of like the bottom line of like, at the end of the project, I'm like, if it's a yes, I'm happy with it. It's like, I've done my job, you know, I'm happy with what I've done. I would put that in my portfolio. I mean, I'm proud of it. But there's still like the odds one sometime when you're like, well, actually, like that kind of like lost a lot of kind of like what I want to do with it. So it's kind mm. of a blend. So, but you, you feel a bit disappointed, you know, but that's, you can't, you can't do great work all the time. So that happens, obviously. And also as well, I find that if you look at a lot of like really famous directors and stuff, the way they start off um, in uh, music videos and commercials and stuff as well, it does give you a time and it gives you um, an, a, a, a space to start working on your style, working on how you would shoot things. So it's almost like a training ground that you get paid for. So it's paid tuition, which always helps. Yeah, essentially, yeah, that's why I kind of like learned my craft. You know, I started like, you know, it was assistants on sets, kind of like looking around, like finding out about cameras, lenses, you know, how to talk to actors, you know, mm. uh, even like movements of cameras, everything. You kind of like remember that. And then when you make a movie, you can finally apply all the things you kind of like learned and kind of like have fun with it as well. Because in commercials and advertising, everything is planned in advance. There's a script, there's a storyboard. You have to, you know, the client sign off on it. You have to stick yeah. to it. When you make a short film, you kind of like you have that storyboard, you know what you want to do. But like I like to kind of like give space to kind of like improvise as well, just not just for the actors, but also for the directors and the DOPs. So actually I just thought like that camera movement could be great. Let's let's give it a try, you know. 
That's such a wonderful way of putting it as well. And I completely agree with that from an acting perspective as well, that you have a sense of where you're going, but how you get there can change each take each yeah. time, because that's where the true collaboration and joy is found in the moment where you sort of lose yourself and find yourself again. And it's yeah. interesting to hear that from a directing perspective as well, that that's what you're looking for as well, that you have a shot list, but maybe on the day you see something in a performance or in a space that you're in and you can go, I want to see where that goes and check that out. Yeah, no, exactly. I know if you remember that scene we shot together uh, in the flat, where it was like a, essentially a fight scene. Yes. And we had the storyboard for it, we had the script for it, but when we got there, I kind of like asked you with you and your resting background and kind of like mm -hmm. background, like what do you think, how would you do it? And I think it's important to leave, like everyone's got a certain craft and specialty. As a director, I'm not a stuntman, I don't have a resting background, so it's important to make sure you ask people their opinion and how they would do it and you bring that into the making as well. And I mean, that scene now is like one of the best of the movie. I absolutely love it. Like we shot the violence in a very <laughs> realistic kind of way. You know, it looks, it look, it doesn't look fake. It looks authentic. And it looks like as an audience, you kind of like part of that scene. And you are the actor, kind of are the one that kind of like told us actually, guys, we should do this and that, you know, maybe like going that way would be better. And kind of like having everyone's opinion and kind of like having a dialogue, a discussion, I think is very important, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree as well. And, and yeah, and I think you said something very true there as well, that uh, the greatest, uh, if, if you look as a director, as a leader, sometimes the greatest thing of a leader or someone that's bringing a whole project together is to surrender to other people and their specialities as well. Yeah. Understanding that you have to have a scope of, under, of understanding and intelligence about everything on set. But at the same time, if someone says, this is what we can do, you can yeah. trust in that as well, knowing that you've got the best and knowing that you've got your team working with you and you're all collaborating together as opposed to having to try and do everything yourself as well like having that micro uh managing idea that doesn't really always help the product either yeah no, exactly and i think that's the job of a director you know it's, you have a vision and it's kind of yeah. like being the right people for that vision and making sure like everyone gets along together to like create craft that vision essentially but you're not the ultimate dictator of like it has to be this way i think it's about listening to people and respecting their craft as well Completely. And I think as an actor as well, it's for me, it's always been about trusting that I might have my ideas. I'll just set the script and have an idea of what this guy's yeah. backstory is, what he's doing in the moment. But at the same time, if a director comes up to me and says, this is what I need the character to be, particularly if they're the script writer as well, then it's my, or have a very good close relationship with the script writer. It's my job to give that agency that's my number one thing for yeah. me anyway personally because that's the vision you have and it's as a creative it's my job to access that for you as opposed to keep like always taking it up in my own way yeah no exactly definitely and i think that's what's interesting is every actor is going to have a different interpretation of like a character mm -hmm. if you give the script to like a hundred people you're going to have like a hundred different like you know character bring brought to life essentially everyone's gonna have their own kind of like vision and interpretation of that character and i think that's what's fascinating it's just like endless possibilities and it's up to you as a director to kind of like make that decision of like what's closer to what you have in mind essentially and I completely agree with that. And also as well, you can have the same actor could read the script six months down the line and have a completely different interpretation for life things that you know happen to well same with what the films we're going to talk today everyone has favorite films some of them cycle in and out but i know i watch my favorite films once a year and the yeah. way i view them the way they suddenly speak to me is completely yeah. different to what i felt before that's the joy of art really and creative yeah, creation. Exactly. every time you rewatch something you kind of like notice something new like yeah. the movement the way of saying things a certain word and you're like yeah that makes sense actually yeah that's what i love about rewatching movies Exactly. Right. Well, thank you for getting me to rewatch these three today. So before we start, let's uh, I'd love to you to name the three and then we can pick the first one to have a chat about. If that's all right. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first one is La Hen, a classic Oof. French movie. And obviously, yeah, the French guy uh, art to kind of like the French movie. <laughs> uh, second one is American History X. Uh, same again, to me, it's a bit of an American version of like La Hen in terms of like yeah. big tackles as well. And the last one, a big horror fan, so I had to get <laughs> one in there. It's uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Amazing. So, and yeah, and it, well, where would you like to start? Let's start with La Hen. Brilliant. Yeah. Free, but in a way, free low budget films, but free yeah. absolutely genre breaking films as well. And free films that belie their budget. They're absolutely an incredible choice. And I'm so glad you're starting with this one because I, I got to watch this again just the other night. and. I was blown away by how current it still is, how fresh it still looks. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, why Lahan? But it's an easy one to say. <laughs> why not? <laughs> left, 
uh, an impression on me. Like it came out in the, in the late nineties when I was, I think I was ten or eleven when I first watched it, and it mm. just felt like more like a documentary rather than yes. a movie. And it's the first time you know watching a movie at the time. There's a lot of, a lot of American movie big production on TV. And that watching that movie, I don't know, it felt just like watching it was so real. You know, it felt like you're part, you know, the guys, you're part of like part of there. You feel like you essentially like with them in that movie, the way it's shot, you know, the black and white just adds some bleakness to, you know, the estate kind of like condition environment as well. And obviously the whole political climate of the 90s in France when there was like these riots because um, a teenager got shot. And yeah. you would see that on the news and then you'd see it in the movie so it felt like it was anchored so much in real life that I don't know it just left such a big impression on me and it's just like working class characters you know it's just these three kind of like teenagers that come from the estates you know you get like you know these guys like we have friends like that you know they feel like you can relate to these people you feel like you know these people so you just it, and the whole thing just felt felt so real yeah. and obviously a very tragic story and short uh, the fact that it's short over 24 hours and you got that yes. make um, of the clock ticking you know every every hour or so of the movie and it's just like yeah it just, just adds some more like gripping elements to it and you feel like you're on that journey with those guys you kind of like even though they're kind of like not perfect they're not like you know they're not essentially nice guys but you still like you end up like relating to them understanding why they're so angry you know what they're doing what they're doing it's a very tragic story essentially like they're on the hunt for revenge because one of their friends got killed by a cop during a riot and they essentially they want to shoot a cop to kind of like establish the balance so it's a very kind of like dark topic, but you end up understanding what they want to do it. And that's 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 when you know it's a good movie, when you kind of like start sympathizing for like things that are bad and dark essentially. And, and you're like, wow, I understand why they actually want to do that, because you're like on that journey with them. Yes. And even the way it was shot, you know, there's like it feels like very documentary, the camera is very fluid, you kind of like follow the guys around. But then you got this kind of like little moments. There's one where like Vincent Cassel is like dancing in like a basement and it feels like almost like a fever dream. But yes. it, just, it, it just incorporates so well in that reality. It's just, it was just such a unique style at the time. And yeah, I think even rewatching it now is still like such a gem of a movie. Like no one's ever done something like that ever since. And I think it's just unique at every point. I, I think for me, I mean, watching it, I completely got immersed in the storytelling and I never yeah. found it jarring but there are some really like you can't believe the budget and some of the camera shots they get like there's a drone yeah. shot that looks like something out of a Gaspar Noe film there is like a push-in shot that looks incredible there's one yeah. where it's attached to the front of the car when they're driving around Paris and stuff yeah. and he's like how are they getting these shots they look absolutely incredible but it never feel it never takes away from like you say that documentary feel the, the script yeah. is so perfect everyone feels real and like I say for me the thing that I really latch onto it feels like they had a life before the film and some of them will have a life after but they feel fully fleshed out fully realized characters yeah. as well that's the thing you mentioned the drone shot it's actually funny because that shot i think was like the biggest part of their budget because at the time there was no drone yeah so they had to use like a small helicopter to do that wow. shot wow because the, I think that I saw the, um, the interview on that because the sun was like shining a certain way, you could see the shadow of the helicopter in the scene. So they had to remove the, the shadow using like CGI, and that was like oh. the biggest chunk of budget in the movie. Like that, just That's... one scene of like, yeah, it's just so funny. It, it, it's crazy now as well as like when you look at stuff like that that can be done instantly with a drone. I remember seeing a video the other day where someone with a drone recreated the start of The Shining. When Kubrick yeah. shot the beginning of The Shining, it cost him three quarters of a million dollars. This guy's done it with a, a $200 drone. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's mad how technology, I know it's very much with AI and stuff, people are scared of it, but do you feel as well that with the way that technology is coming along now, the shots that you can get and the... Uh, filmic vocabulary it gives you do you see the benefit in that at all that like what you can achieve with like such less equipment now and stuff as well and money yeah a hundred percent absolutely i mean back in the days i remember when i started getting into movies i was like 11 or 12 i had to borrow my dad camcorder if i wanted to make a movie you know like and you have to like buy tapes you have to charge a camcorder it was a whole process to kind of like shoot a video with your friends yeah now that is like i mean an iphone you got 4k on that you can shoot a movie on an iphone you got access yes. to so many like equipments like so easily drones you can rent a drone for like quite good prices you got iphones you got like anyone these days can shoot something they want to and that's yeah. why i appreciate 
it gives it gives movie an access that and a bigger access to where it used to be. If you wanted to shoot a movie back in the days, it was like a very privileged background. You need money, you need to rent equipment. Mm. Nowadays, everyone's got an iPhone, you know, and everyone can shoot a movie. It's not about like having like a red camera that costs like ten grand. It's about having a knife and just running with it. And that's what I always tell to people like like junior and stuff. Like, oh, how do I make a movie? I don't have any money. I was like, just do something with your fun. Yeah. Like, if you got a idea, it doesn't matter like what equipment you use. Like if the idea is solid, if you put your if you have fun with it, try try different things, try different shots that you can do that with an iPhone. Hundred percent. I can I completely agree as well. And that's the thing with technology as well. It doesn't matter really and i think when people say this it doesn't matter how far technology comes you, exactly what you just said there you need the idea you need the true yeah. the true artistic expression that's what yeah. makes it sticks anybody can you know like film something now but it's like what are you saying that makes it worthwhile what are you yeah. saying that makes it resonate throughout the years like I say lahan it was filmed in the 90s but now 30 years later it's just as present yeah, well, it's just as um visceral and it affects you just as much yeah but I'd rather watch like a low budget movie shot on an iPhone that's got a great story that's a million pounds production from America. That's just the same thing that we've seen like 30 times, you know? Yeah. And, and do you, I mean, this is why I've always been a massive fan of world cinema and stuff as well. Today, I'm quite switched on to Korean cinema. Do you think it is that uniqueness of voice that's so important to cinema now as opposed to? Oh, it's hard sometimes because there is some good stuff coming out of America, but the major studios just releasing something that almost feels cookie cutter. They're repeat repeating the same stories yeah. over and over again. There's a lot of like remake being done. It's always been the case, you know. Like there's so many movies we get like one, two, three, four, like a remake or like a sequel or a prequel. And mm. I think like the movie that people watch these days and work these days. If you look at A24, they do like oh. all like original stories. And you can see that oh, A24 just grew up in the cinema landscape in the last 10 years. It's amazing. They become like the number one kind of like, you know, production house, essentially. And yeah. not only in, horror, in like different genres as well, because the ideas they kind of like produced are just new and original. And that excites people. And everything they come out with, you're like, fuck, that's great. Like, I've never seen that before. Like, if you look at Hereditary, Midsommar. Oh. Uh, recently, there was uh, Talk To Me. I'm not sure that's A24, but Talk To Me is some Australian horror yeah. movie. Oh, sorry, that was fucking amazing. Yeah. And now I'm doing a movie about the back rooms as well. That's all kind of like original oh, concept. And 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 that that's something really interesting as well that you mentioned because of back rooms. For anyone who doesn't know, it's sort of like an interactive uh, thing you find online where it starts to be. It's really based around like weird rooms and, and security cameras, and then but you feel very immersed in it. And that almost seems to me something the way that I, I know A24 have started to develop into video games and stuff as well. So almost yeah. crossing that boundary of immersion and where yeah. does the film end? Is that something that excites you at all? Oh, yeah, 100%. Even I'm a big gamer as well. Even video <laughs> games, like the level of video game these days, it's like so immersive. It's almost yes. like, you know, actor used to be ashamed of doing voiceover on like video games. It's, it felt like a bit like a, a second tiered kind of job when you could get an, an acting job, you'd do like a voiceover job for like, a video game yeah. nowadays the same level as making a movie if yeah. you watch like video games there's one called until done which is like a horror oh. video game that came out 10 years ago yeah the acting nuts i mean the voiceover the storytelling the mechanism it's incredible it's like a pure immersive experience it's even more immersive than watching a movie because you're playing the character yeah it gets to that level where like video games are a craft and an art in itself just are the same title as movies I think for me, to that point as well, looking at something like The Ghost of Tsushima and being a massive yeah. Akira Kurosawa fan, and when you switch on Kurosawa mode in that, there's very little difference. Like it feels like you're watching you're you're, you're watching a yeah. film. It's 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 beautifully done, and even things like uh, The Last of Us and Fallout, where you are getting yeah. a story told with a video game IP, where you can play the game and watch it, and they're different enough that they both sort of complement each other. So it's very yeah. interesting to see how Hollywood and big producers yeah. are sort of exploring this now as well. It just shows the quality of like video game these days. If Hollywood's taking inspiration from like video games to turn yeah. into movies, that's just how good the story is. Exactly. And and do you feel that I mean that's why something like the hand does so well as well? Just that uniquity, that trueness of vision, and maybe that when you have a lower budget, all right, you have to be a little bit more inventive, but there's less um need to have so many producers that want certain things featured in the film yeah. that you have to be constrained in so many ways so maybe that lower budget means a better purity of vision 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think like the less budget, the less people are involved, the less sign off. It's just like advertising. So the yes. more, you, the more you can be true to your vision, and I think that's what I believe like strongly as well. Is having being forced to like watch with smaller budget is having a skeleton crew. You can be flexible. You can move anywhere. You know, you can you don't have to set up like you know for hours on ends. It's just all right. Let's let's go there. Let's try that. And yeah. I think just like, four or five people in the crew is all you need. Like two actors. One camera operator, you know, script supervisors and director, and that's it, you know, and you can be flexible, you can fly, you can, yeah, you're just a lot more flexible and just, it gives you freedom to try things and go off script a bit and being a bit more experimental. Well, then, I mean, I can only imagine working like a big budget film and you got like fucking five producers in the corner saying, well, the client doesn't like that. And then you yes. got the brand that finance the movie as well. No, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's too violent. And it's just like this chain of people like giving you like feedback. And that's yes. why, yeah losing the essence and that's always i always say that it's like everyone's a critic but not everyone's an artist so it's, <laughs> easy, but it's, it's hard it's hard to craft something as, as a creative you know like you have a vision you have to be true to it and having feedback it's it's very something you have to be very careful of it's like what feedback you decide to to follow i'm always open to listen to feedback but it's also my decision to decide what feedback i'm gonna go with as well because if you take everyone's feedback when it's not it's not it's not your, your work anymore it's not your craft anymore it's just everyone's work you know and also as well, you can become, I always liken it to a thing in uh, fitness that I always, where it's called paralysis through analysis, where you get so much yeah. feedback, you're frightened, and I've seen this happen in actors as well, you're frightened to make any decisions at all because you can't please everyone. So like you said, yeah. at some point you have to understand the validity uh, of this feedback and go, okay, that's the direction I'm going to go with. Yeah, exactly. If you take it, it's just end up being like a Frankenstein monster, you know, you can't it, just take it everyone's got a different vision of that thing so if you just listen to everyone at the end of the day it's just everyone's piece of work and it's just not it's not yours anymore so it's and not your you, business and your you, vision. Yeah. exactly and would you say this is the problem with Hollywood, and maybe not hollywood but with maybe bigger budget pictures at the moment with the constant script rewrites and reshoots that there is no co-joined vision anymore it, it's like almost just different bits all joined in together and it's like become a, a sort of a mashup of a film where there's no real emotional sort of through line. So it's hard for people to get so emotionally involved in it. I think so. Yeah, definitely. But that's, it's a good, it's a good topic to start on actually, because in American history X, I saw like this video of the director that was protesting is an English guy. It was protesting in the streets of London saying the movie was like nothing like what he wanted. Essentially, mm. He made his cut, he made his edit, sent it to the studio, and the studio completely recut the movie and made something different with it. So even though the movie is absolutely amazing, apparently that's not the movie he wanted at all. And he even asked for his name to be changed in the credits so people wouldn't know it's him that directed the movie. That's all wow. embarrassed you all on that piece of work. I found that fascinating. That's a perfect example of like having your work being changed by people it's not your work anymore. Well, let, let, I mean, let's bounce across to American History X, and I mean, it would be a great one. Similar Similarities to Lahane that struck me when I was watching it was the yeah. jumps into black and white. Uh, yeah. but again, the uh, interviews to camera, very much a documentary feel. Um, even yeah. though it's a bigger, we jump backwards and forwards in time, um, there's still a ticking clock feel to it. Something yeah. big, it, that sense of, in, in and with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, thinking about it as well, a sense of yeah. impending doom. We are moving towards something and it do, we've yeah. done what it is, but we don't feel good about it. Um, American yeah. History X also dealing with sort of racism and prejudice and yeah. stuff as well. And the ability to change and maybe not being the person you thought you were. Um, yeah. yeah, but I mean, where it, it is an interesting point. I forgot about that. With Edward Norton mentions it as well. The uh, the the lead actor in it. How much that film changed, and what the original might have looked like as well. I've never seen the original one. I don't no, think me that, either. But I'd be interested to see because the guy he looks so pissed off at the final version. Like it must have been like really different. So I'd be I'd be quite curious to see that original version because yeah, it seems yeah. to be quite quite angry at it. So that means this has been a, a big difference, obviously. So yeah, that'd be interesting to see. I'd be, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if it would, if maybe the jumping in narrative back and through, through, forth in time, maybe the uh, stylistic changes of colour to black and white and stuff as well. It would, yeah. But yeah, but yeah. yeah. and interestingly as well, like having, because normally the, the normal uh, chain is that it gets taken away from the director and it becomes like cut to ribbons by the producers just trying to make a quick profit and it sort of sinks into obscurity. But Imagine having a film recut where suddenly it's lauded as pretty much a masterpiece. It's an interesting, but you, you yeah. don't recognise it anymore. That's a I don't hear that happening too often. 
now it's as a thing like a post production, like the edit of a movie, like it makes fifty percent of a movie. What you shoot yeah. is just fifty percent, and you can with that what you shot, you can essentially make like four or five movies. I know, like we've done two cuts of Bird Limes, and it yeah. feels like two different movies, even though the, the the storytelling is the same, the mechanism are the same, the characters are the same. You could completely change the story with an edit, and I found that fascinating as well. That editing mm. process. Like Lewis and I did it on our own because obviously low budgets and Lewis had the skill to edit. And what we did is that we sat down for like fucking 24 hours on end for like four weekends in a row, just like working on the movie. And there's so many options. It almost go crazy. You're like, oh my yeah. God, one shot it just change the story. But like, is it better or is it worse? It's like, and that's why the director, you have to make decisions as well of what you want. Because yeah. the edit, so many possibilities. You have to know, be comfortable with your vision. And be yeah, be yeah, be as confident as you can be with your vision as well to make sure you make the right decision because you can completely fuck the movie in the edit as well. And that's I mean, I mean, that's the thing from an active perspective as well. You give your best performance on the day, but then you are at the mercy of the edit as well and yeah. how it was everybody has to be hitting that creative peak as they hit their point yeah. in the movie that they need. Was the sound correct? Was the was the camera in focus? was the director yeah. like getting what they needed to get that shot and then like you say it all gets taken away removed and then you have to look at all of this footage and decide that's the best take that's the moment i want the audience yeah. to focus on this is how i want it scored this is or if i want any music in that moment at all does the performance stand by itself and it's such an amalgamation of so many different things you have to go through to get the balance and also i mean how for you how do you like, so to speak, kill your darlings? How do you sort of go, okay, that's the point I want and not keep picking at it, not keep going back? Or is it a real almost impossible thing to do? I mean, yeah, it, it seems like an impossible thing to do. But like what I do is essentially I try a different combination and then yeah. you kind of this gut feeling. It's like that feels right to me. That feels close to the vision. That feels close to what I in mind. Let's go with that. And then obviously you got happy accent as well. When you try something, you know, I don't think that's going to work. Actually, yeah, it looks amazing. So, okay, let's use it. That's part of the process as well. Sure. Even the footage, you know, like I didn't realize how many hours of footage we had for Birdline, which is like a 20 minute short film. We've got like, I don't know, hundreds of hours of footage. Mm. It's just like, turning down to like 20 minutes. That's a big decision for a director as well. What yes. you left what you use, because you want to you want to use everything, right? If you shot it, it's because you like it. But you have to make decisions as well, and you have to leave some shots that are like brilliant and beautiful because it just doesn't add anything to the movie at the end. So at the end of the day, you have to think about the audience as well and make sure like what they see is relevant and add something to the storytelling. And that's such an important point you bring up as well, because there does seem to be a real propensity in Hollywood. And I'm sorry, I keep going back to Hollywood. But in films that are coming out in cinema at the moment, they've definitely shortened out. There's not many films coming through. But everything seems to be getting longer and longer yeah. and longer, two hours plus. I remember going to see Killers of the Flower Moon, which was almost four hours plus. And I'm just yeah. like, do you feel that? But I remember back in the show, my age now, back in the day, 80s, when films seem to be 90 minutes in and out, because that was like almost a peak thing for a, a, a movie to be. Do you feel that movies are almost getting a bit too long now in their epicness? Or do you think just it, it's as long as it needs to be? I think, yeah, but I think that's like the whole Netflix things and streaming services where series became more popular. So it's yes. essentially more time to immerse in the story. It's longer story. you got more characters. you got time to immerse in every characters. And I think movies are trying to replicate that in, in movie format, which to mm. me doesn't... Well, I'm a big fan of the 90 minutes format. To me, I think it's a perfect lens for yeah, the movie. Yeah, me too. And that's why I'm a big fan of horror movies, because most of the time they're like 90 minutes. But obviously you've got directors like Scorsese. I can't imagine like a 90 minute Scorsese movie. You know, it's oh. so, <laughs> so much details in his stories that he need those kind of like three hours. But sometime I go and watch a movie. It might, it might be controversial, but I went to watch June, which was like, mm. yes hours it does feel like it could be shortened to like two hours to me it feels like sometimes i don't know there's a lot of beautiful shots you know the landscape the, the set design is beautiful but like sometimes it feels like it's just there for the for the sake of it sure sure and like, I might be but there's a big fan base beyond june but like yeah that's just my opinion <laughs> I mean, and that, that's, I mean, that's it. Subjective. Everybody's entitled yeah. to one. I just think for me as well, like it's like what is true and exactly what you said, what does resonate with the audience? Not everything is going to resonate with everyone, but at the same side, where does the dividing line become between essential and just superfluous and just like yeah. this doesn't really add anything anymore. But you like you say, it's, sometimes it's hard to let go. It's hard to let yeah. go of a particular moment that me, could mean so much to you, but won't mean so much to an audience viewing it. 
Yeah, no, exactly. And I think that's, that's where coming from an advertising background helps as well, because in advertising, you can't afford to kind of just have shots for the sake of beauty. Yes. Keep the audience, you know, hooked on what they're watching. You have to sell them something at the end. So you have to make sure the attention spam is there and you have to go straight to the point. So you have to build like a storytelling mechanism that can kind of like take the audience on the journey and you don't lose them. And that's that's a, it's, it's quite an interesting exercise. That's something I try to replicate in 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 my movies as well. Kind of like making sure there's kind of like what we call the emotional curve. Yes. And you, kind of like, you know, you kind of like drag it up and down to kind of like playing with the audience emotion to make sure they stay hooked on what they're watching. And I think to me that's really important. Putting yourself in the shoes of the audience and making sure you don't lose them because you can't be too selfish. If you make a movie for yourself, that movie might be three hours and some shot might be useless. And but you can't you can't afford to do that because at the end of the day, what well, the movie you're making is for the audience as well. A hundred percent. And I, I mean, yeah, keeping attention and without having to rely on tricks, act, but making sure, is this essential? Is this is this necessary for the story? And is this still getting what yeah. I want the theme and the subtext of the movie to be about? So in a way, getting that creative lesson from advertising, it makes everything necessary that you can you can gain a lesson in all different forms of, of creative in, like indulgence. Yeah, no, exactly. That's like the question I was kind of like asking myself in the edit. It's like, what does it bring to the story? Is it necessary mm. with that? Is the story still is the story still the same? And that's where you kind of like kind of like find the balance. It's like, okay, if I remove that, actually the story is still the same. So let's let there's no need for that shot there. And actually, if I remove that, the story changes. So the shot needs to be there. And a hundred percent. I mean, and I, I mean, I love the two different versions of Birdlime as well that you created because one is substantially, it's almost half the length. But I love the fact that the gaps in it, I always say with art, and I'd love to know your opinion on this, sometimes what you leave up to interpretation, if you explain exactly, yeah. and I think this is another thing with some films as well now, that if you explain everything, all the exposition, all the backstory, which happens a lot in prequels, suddenly all of these little imaginings that you can have as an audience get lost. If you explain exactly what it is, then it can't be personal to the audience anymore. But sometimes it's in those gaps where people read their own interpretation into it and then it becomes a lot more meaningful to them and a lot more memorable as well. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think like leaving things for interpretation, I'm a big fan of that. And even like in horror movies, you look at today's horror movies, it's a lot of like showing, it's a lot of like yeah. necessary go and it kind of like takes the, the, the scare away. You know, you're not scared anymore. But once you see something, you're not really scared of it anymore. Exactly. And what, what you don't see is what you're being scared of. Like, if you implied violence in the movie without showing it, the violence takes place in your head. It's your own imagination that makes the violence, and that's the scariest shit you can see. Exactly. Like, yeah. It's always the fear of what if, right? It is always what is in that dark area yeah. that you can't see into, yeah. because then your mind goes... It, it, it's yeah. like... We, we, we always talk about dreaming and, and the creative, but there yeah. is that fear response that comes in horror films very quickly where what is it? What is behind the door screening like a pig yeah. to quote your exactly. next film? <laughs> but um, everyone has a different vision of that, you know, because we all have different kind of like visual inspiration and stuff. So your brain is going to make the worst stuff to imagine, you know, and some person might be like horrific, some person might be better, but yes. everyone's going to have a vision. If you, if, you, if you do that in a movie and you do a test and you ask someone to like, oh, describe me what was in your head when you saw that scene everyone's going to have a different kind of like interpretation of like what they think is behind that door. And I think that's even better. Yeah, exactly. exactly. The, 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 the fear of what if, and also as well, taking it into the positive aspect as well, or, uh, of like not always thinking about fear. Also the ability to dream of what could be. And that's yeah. maybe what films lift you in the opposite way. If they don't explain everything, you'll imagine then after the film ends, you can imagine what happened to the characters and what where they go next. And I think that's a beautiful thing as well. The aspiration of like, what could be, what could I achieve? What could these characters achieve? But also, Jesus, what's in the corner that's going to come out and crawl all over me and kill me? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, let me uh, just hang up here, mate, and I'll call you back in two seconds. Give me a minute. No worries. Hang up. I was just going to say, we were just finishing off on American History X, and I do feel yeah. the way we're talking about horror cinema, which is also close to me as well, back in the day when I was young and very into graphic films and stuff as well. But uh, then more into how it seems like a very big, a lot of directors now get their start, Blumhouse as well as another sort of place yeah. where you'll get given a budget and then something like Talk To Me, they seem to become very sore. They become popular, they get a big following and then it enables you to go both ways so it seems to me like horror has become even though it's sort of frowned upon by some people in cinema considered lowbrow it's actually tremendously popular 
it's very yeah. financially successful if you want to go that way. But also the way we use sor uh, horror as a subtext, as a way to question society, like really the underlying message of talk to me, like the underlying of underlying lesson of uh, and message of, uh, for me anyway, Texas Chainsaw Massacre about class and society. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it can be a tremendously persuasive and uh, like subjective and, and sort of really a great way to inspire debate inspire debate i mean and also as well texas chainsaw massacre at the beginning and at the end one of the very very first um found footage films as well yeah no exactly i think horror is a great great uh media to kind of like gets across like social messages back in the yeah. 90s it was enough like what i call like social drama where it's kind of this documentary style like american history x stuff like that I think nowadays this type of kind of like topics would translate really well in horror. Like you said, like Jordan Peele does that really well oh. as well, using like, you know, these kind of like societal issues and turning them into like horror movie. And it's even stronger because it kind of like puts the horror of our society in your face. Yes. And I, like it just does that really well. You know, all the TV shows and the movies is done. Um, it's just like, yeah, horror is just such a powerful thing to get across like a strong message. Yes. And I, I think now, like, as well, OK, horror does have that thing where a little while, especially in the early 2000s, uh, it went almost towards, like, what they called a torture porn route, where, like, it was who could show the most extreme thing. But as we have both mentioned, sometimes it's about the imagination. I thought, um, I, I, I think the restraint of Texas Chainsaw Massacre is admirable. Maybe it was down to budgetary reasons, but yeah. there's so much in that that is left to like what you don't see, but you can only imagine what's going on and how terrifying it is as well. Like it's yeah. one of those films that I always say you can smell it. <laughs> you, yeah. can, you can, you can feel what it's like in that place, but you're not actually there. It, everything looks so real. It's funny you say you can smell it because there's that scene where they're sitting at the table and you got all these kind of like dishes of meat on the table and you got all this weird family kind of like fisting yeah. together. And apparently like, due to low budget that to reuse the same meat and they were like reshooting the scene to the point where the meat got like rotten and the people were, like, actually felt like sick on set because of that so when you say I can smell that movie like it, it, there's a reason for that actually like I'm sure like the smell of it would have been very pungent <laughs> and it, it amazes me as well how long in England it was banned for and stuff as well and people saying so if you've not seen it go and watch it it's incredible but the uh the me hook going through the woman's back and people saying oh they actually saw the hook come out the hook never yeah. comes out but just that that fear that what the mind starts yeah. creating because it's such an intense film and again even though some of the shots are set up, it still feels very documentary, like yeah. the extreme yeah, yeah, yeah. close-ups and everything as well. I mean, it was a lot of handheld shots. And that's why I'm a huge fan of handheld shots. You mm. feel as a part of the action, you're running with the characters. you got all these movements that essentially replicate the movements of your eyes if you're running. So you give you like a sense of reality that you don't get with like, you know, more stable cameras. And I think like a mix of like stable cameras and handheld cameras is like the perfect mix for me when you make a movie. Because yes. you give that you know, immersive impression. But yeah, it's also like one of the first movies that's set in like, horror movies set in like broad daylight. Yes. Like that's like, all your movies like, you know, always in darkness, haunted mansion, dark places. This one is like in Texas, in the scorching heat, in the sun, in broad daylight. It's like such like a unique things as well. And for me, it's one of those ones that is like being endlessly remade, prequels, sequels, too much explained about it. But then even with recent films that I'm really enjoying, like X and Pearl, that yeah. they they own they owe such a, 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 a vow of thanks for that original vision of getting something yeah. that even like I say, because of the found footage, something like Blair Witch, which did so yeah. well by itself, that you can see such a through line in there, what they're copying about. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, all these movies would not exist without, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, yeah. fan footage, you know, vision, that kind of, like, outcast families, weird outcast families that, you know, lost in the middle of nowhere. Like, X is essentially, like, so inspired by, like... And watching X, it was the first time I had that feeling, that the same feeling I had when watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes! Right, man, of flower, they get into this place in the middle of nowhere. It's, like, it's hot, you know, it's got these weird families. Like, the atmosphere is heavy. And that's something you rarely find in movies these days. And like the last time I had this feeling was watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I had this feeling again watching X and I loved it. 
I think one of the big things about uh, we talk about leaving stuff up to the audience's interpretation as well. And sometimes when you see the, the villain or, or, or the evil presence, it becomes less scary. I think because you never see uh, um, what have got his name, Leatherface, his real face. He only yeah. com- or they only communicate in grunts and squeaks and pig noises that yeah. that is so scary as well, because you don't truly know what they are. They could now, be anything under that mask. And that's what makes them so terrifying. Yeah, same again. I mean, it comes back to what we said earlier. It's like not they're not knowing and you just imagine, you know, it just adds so much mystery to it. And that's why like, the character is just it's still iconic today. They're still remaking version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's still like one of the biggest, you know, monster in like the horror genre. It's, sure. it's, just, it's just so mysterious, you know. And one thing that actually made me laugh when I was watching it back, um, I never got, there's actually a weird sort of sense of humor in it as well, that Leatherface, when he's just sitting on the bed, whacking his head and you can hear the people around outside, I think he pretty much just wants to be left alone. I, I'm yeah. sure, I think he wouldn't have started really killing them, but because he was just like, Oh, you know, bloody kids from the you know from from the coast and stuff. I just want them to leave me alone. So there's almost a slight weird sense of humor going on there as well. Yeah, it's a sort of like empathy, you know. It's like what is he doing? What is he, like the origin story? Yes, they've done a few like movies about origin stories on like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which wasn't that good. But I think there's so much potential to like, why is he the way that he is? You know, how did he grow up and stuff like that? It's just yeah, like, it's just around that character that just makes it so much better. I, I think I think as well, like truly what can be a monster as well. Like I always really like the idea, okay, he could be a mate or they could be completely uh, sort of like disfigured and sort of having a really bad sort of like disability on and whatever in their face. Yeah. But then at the same time, they could be completely like normal looking underneath that mask. Yeah. Uh, but exactly. it's just they choose to speak in grunts and squeaks and stuff, which is just as terrifying. Yeah, but it's, just, it's the mystery that makes it such an iconic movie as well. Like not knowing, like I said, not knowing who he is, why does he talk like that, you know, what's going on. Even the rest of the family, you know, everyone, yes. the granddad to the, the brother, to like they're all like weird in their own way. And there's just like each each character could essentially have their own movie. And that's, that's why there's so much depth in that movie. You can yeah. see how you can kind of like, you can make a story about the granddad, you know. And yeah, I, I just love that. You can see so much possibilities just watching those characters. And there's not necessarily like a lot of dialogue. But the way they act, the way they dress, yes. you know, look, the, it's the small manners that makes these characters so impactful. And the thing as well, one, one, nothing, they never break the rules of their own universe. I think you said something earlier on about um, even if you're meeting characters in it, uh, and, and basic in all three of these films, there are characters that do stuff that maybe on a, on a psychological level, we, we don't agree with, ethical level, we don't agree with, but in themselves, they are completely justified. And surely do you find that as well, that that's what makes these films so memorable as well, that you don't agree with what they're doing with, but you can understand it. And that makes you question yourself as well. That's what I mean. That's the power of like movies. When you start kind of like relating to just kind of like bad characters, you're like, that's how a movie is powerful. It makes you question your own integrity, you know, your own sanity. Yes. That's why I love it. Same with American historians, like obviously very racist and, you know, but as you follow this family and you see the story, the backstory of the dad that got shot in a bad neighborhood, you start understanding like why they are the way that they are. Yeah. You start questioning yourself and you're like, fuck, he's such an evil character. And yet, you know, I understand who, like why he's like that. And that's, and that's, that's, that's a good movie. It makes you think, you know. And you know what, actually, now you're just saying that as well, I've realized that there is, I'd love you to know, because all three of them, all right, the, the first one, Lahaine, they're, they're not related, but they are a family. They're a brotherhood. Yeah. Uh, American History X, very him and uh, Edward Norton, Edward Furlong, are very much a family, but they just get yeah. perverted in their love for each other. They go down the racist route. And Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as scary as they all are, they see as these outsiders almost trying to break up the family, disrupting the family. Now, the way they choose to deal with that by carving them up, <laughs> maybe not yeah. the best way of dealing with outsiders. But it's almost that, yeah, that fear that this this in, sort of family that are like in that house, they are. This is how they choose to deal with the other. This is how they react out of fear and change is to kill them, to get rid of yeah. them. And yeah, exactly. It's almost like three different degrees of like reaction towards society. Right. That, that right. Is just anger and rioting. American History X pushed it further with like murder and like going to prison. And then yeah. you got like Texas Massacre, which is just straight up insanity. Right. 
Yeah, but again, even in this insanity, even in this thing that you never get to see its face, you never get to hear its voice, you still understand its motivation yeah. and justification, yeah. which is so... Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing piece of work. Do you have a favourite scene in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre at all? I know it's tricky. I, I, I'm going to go with the ending scene when the girl is running away, running away oh. in the back and you see like Leatherface dancing with the chainsaw. It's just yeah. one of those scenes, it's just so absurd, but like, yeah, it's so iconic and like just, it just adds so much to the movie, like the insanity of him dancing with his chainsaw on the, as the sun is setting, it's just so powerful. I don't know, it's just something about that scene. And knowing as well that even though she has escaped like she's never truly escaping her mind is absolutely broken um i I think as well one of the most powerful things in actual three of these films as well there's not an overbearing soundtrack there is music used in it um in in la haine there's an amazing soundtrack but it's almost incidental it's music that's happening in the background anyway as opposed to laid over the top do you find that very much in the natu- uh, naturalistic performances, the way camera works used to make it feel very natural and documentary. Do you also agree that with music, it shouldn't feel like it's trying to push the audience member too much to be feeling a certain way? Yeah, no, it's the same as the edit. Like the music needs to serve a purpose in the film. It sure. Needs to, that adds to an emotion, needs to like put the emphasis on something that's already there. It shouldn't be there just like for free because you're yes. either trying should be like in La Hand, they've done it so well because the music is not playing over the movie. The, mu- mu- the music is inside the movie. Yes. So the guy playing on, you know, on this on this radio, it's like it's incorporating so nicely. <clears throat> and in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I can't even remember like what music is in there. I think they just use silence all the way to kind of like build attention. There might be some scores to kind of like emphasize the violence, but I don't think there's like a big soundtrack on there. The only one that always remembers me because it's iconic as much as the film itself, when the camera flash is going at the beginning and it does that, yeah, is that, it is that horrible like one yeah. cord being stretched, and that's enough. That's like yeah. Jaws, like in its simplicity, but it's so frightening. You know, something's being stretched beyond its limits, and yeah, bad yeah. things are going to happen. Yeah, yeah, but it's like that's more like sound design rather than like an actual sound track. Sure. Like, design is like so important as well in like movie making. It just it completely makes or breaks the movie as well. So no, like the small sound, like like you said, like that just like disturbing enough one note to one chord is just enough sometimes to kind of like do do the job you know amazing and, and wouldn't you wouldn't you say as well like that when something is done well um that if it's a, a camera shot that's been chosen so you're directing the eye that way if it's a performance if it feels mm. natural and you can see the actors are listening if the sound design is done well that you don't notice it, but it affects you. It's only when you notice yeah. and you can feel yourself being led or you go, oh, that's good acting or oh, that's a nice camera shot. Then the spell is sort of broken that you're obviously, it wasn't a great choice because you're aware that you've become watching a movie again. Yeah, no, it's, I think that's exactly it. Like, it's just like the thing you don't see are the thing that are well, nicely crafted. Yes. You don't see it because it feels natural. It's because it's kind of like it blends in. And the more it blends in, it's because it's, there's a purpose. It's meant to be there. If you start not- noticing things, it becomes unnatural. If it becomes forced, and that's why you realize it maybe shouldn't be in a movie. But yeah, like what f- flows naturally is meant to be there. Essentially, <laughs> it's so interesting because that for me is the antithesis of acting as well. If you're acting, if you're in the moment, if you're playing off another character, you it shouldn't be another character. You are that person and you are listening to the other person or people and you are completely in that moment there is no as soon as you go oh i'm acting now then you're yeah. not doing it and i think it's with watching films as well it's like when i was watching la Haine, I, I i just got stuck into it again so much and i, I had to remember at parts oh this isn't this isn't real but it yeah. felt the ending felt so yeah. affecting yeah. i was like my god i was completely invested you know yeah, yeah no exactly Amazing. Well, listen, mate, we've, we've done it. Um, I love the chat. I know we, I, it feels like with all good conversations, we could go for another hour easily. Yeah, exactly. But um, before you go, is there a place where people can follow you? Thank you so much for your time as well. But is there people, is there places where people can follow you if you want them to? Anything coming out that anyone needs to know about? And I'll put it in the show notes for you. Yeah, I mean, Bird Lime is, uh, is on YouTube. So that's, that's the main thing. And uh, yeah, apart from that, not not I mean, not big on social media. So no, just go go and check out Bert Lime on on YouTube. That'd be great. You should you should. There's a there's a horrible violent man in there as well. But it's in, across the board, incredible performances. Yeah, and we can see you can actually if you go and watch it, you can see what me and Charles have been talking about today in terms of like 
phenomenal editing and making everything so immersive and integral to the piece and nothing nothing that isn't needed that makes that bit a bit better so it was a pleasure to be part of it mate um once again thank you once again for your time i've loved this every second of this and um i look forward to seeing you again in the future as well mate you too mate speak All soon take care now bye now yeah bye